The Story of Civilization, Volume 3, Caesar and Christ, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 7, Side 1. All sects assumed the possibility of magic. The Magi had disseminated their art through the East and had given a new name to old jugglery. The Mediterranean world was rich in magicians, miracle workers, oracles, astrologers, ascetic saints, and scientific interpreters of dreams. Every unusual occurrence was widely hailed as a divine portent of future events. Ascesis, which the Greeks had used to denote the athletic training of the body, came now to mean the spiritual taming of the flesh. Men scourged themselves, mutilated themselves, starved themselves, or bound themselves to one place with chains. Some of them died through self-torture or self-denial. In the Egyptian desert near Lake Mariotis, a group of Jews and non-Jews, male and female, lived in solitary cells, avoided sexual relations, met on the Sabbath for common prayer, and called themselves therapeuti, healers of the soul. Millions believed that the writings ascribed to Orpheus, Hermes, Pythagoras, the Sibyls, etc., had been dictated or inspired by a god. Preachers claiming divine inspiration traveled from city to city, performing apparently miraculous cures. Alexander of Abinotychus trained a serpent to hide its head under his arm and allow a half-human mask to be affixed to its tail. He announced that the serpent was the god Asclepius come to earth to serve as an oracle, and he amassed a fortune by interpreting the sounds made by reeds inserted in the false head. Besides such charlatans, there were probably thousands of sincere preachers of the pagan faiths. Early in the third century, Philostratus painted an idealized picture of such a man in his Life of Apollonius of Tyana. At sixteen, Apollonius adopted the strict rule of the Pythagorean Brotherhood, renouncing marriage, meat, and wine, never shaving his beard, and keeping silence for five years. He distributed his patrimony among his relatives and wandered as a penniless monk through Persia, India, Egypt, Western Asia, Greece, and Italy. He imbibed the lore of the Magi, the Brahmins, and the Egyptian ascetics. He visited temples of any creed, implored the priests to abandon the sacrifice of animals, worshipped the sun, accepted the gods, and taught that behind them there was one supreme unknowable deity. His life of abnegation and piety led his followers to claim that he was the son of a god, but he described himself simply as the son of Apollonius. Tradition credited him with many miracles. He walked through closed doors, understood all languages, cast out demons, and raised a girl from the dead. But he was a philosopher rather than a magician. He knew and loved Greek literature and expounded a simple but exacting morality. Grant me, he prayed the gods, to have little and to desire nothing. Asked by a king to choose a gift, he answered, Dried fruit and bread. Preaching reincarnation, he bade his followers injure no living creature and eat no flesh. He exhorted them to shun enmity, slander, jealousy, and hatred. If we are philosophers, he told them, we cannot hate our fellow men. Sometimes, says Philostratus, he discussed communism and taught that men ought to support one another. He was accused of sedition and witchcraft, came of his own accord to Rome to answer these charges before Domitian, was imprisoned and escaped. He died about A.D. 98 at an advanced age. His followers claimed that he had appeared to them after his death and had then ascended bodily into heaven. What were the qualities that won half of Rome, half the empire, to these new faiths? Partly their classless, raceless character. They accepted all nationalities, all freemen and all slaves, and rode with consoling indifference over inequalities of pedigree and wealth. Their temples were made spacious to welcome the people as well as to enshrine the god. Sibylle and Isis were mother goddesses acquainted with grief, who mourned like millions of bereaved women. He could understand what the Roman deities seldom knew, the emptied hearts of the defeated. The desire to return to the mother is stronger than the impulse to depend upon the father. It is the mother name that comes spontaneously to the lips in great joy or distress. Therefore men as well as women found comfort and refuge in Isis and Sibylle. Even today the Mediterranean worshipper appeals more often to Mary than to the Father or the Son, and the lovely prayer that he most frequently repeats is addressed not to the Virgin but to the Mother, blessed in the fruit of her womb. The new faiths not only entered more deeply into the heart, they appealed more colorfully to the imagination and the senses with processions and chants alternating between sorrow and rejoicing, and a ritual of impressive symbolism that brought fresh courage to spirits heavy with the prose of life. 
The new priesthoods were filled not by politicians occasionally donning sacerdotal garb, but by men and women of all ranks graduating through an ascetic novitiate to continual ministration. By their help, the soul conscious of wrongdoing could be purified. Sometimes the body racked with illness could be healed by an inspiring word or ritual. And the mysteries at which they officiated symbolized the hope that even death might be overcome. Once, men had sublimated their longing for grandeur and continuance in the glory and survival of their family and their clan, and then of a state that was their creation and collective self. Now the old clan lines were melting away in the new mobility of peace, and the imperial state was the spiritual embodiment only of the master class, not of the powerless multitude of men. Monarchy at the top, frustrating the participation and merger of the citizen in the state, produced individualism at the bottom and through the mass. The promise of personal immortality, of an endless happiness after a life of subjection, poverty, tribulation, or toil, was the final and irresistible attraction of the Oriental faiths and of the Christianity that summarized, absorbed, and conquered them. All the world seemed conspiring to prepare the way for Christ. Chapter 25 Rome and Judea, 132 B.C. to A.D. 135 1. Parthia between Pontus and the Caucasus rose the troubled mountains of Armenia, on whose crest, story told, Noah's Ark had found a mooring. Through the fertile valleys ran the roads that led from Parthia and Mesopotamia to the Black Sea. Hence, empires competed for Armenia. The people were Indo-European, akin to the Hittites and the Phrygians, but they had never surrendered their sweeping Anatolian nose. They were a vigorous race, patient in agriculture, skilled in handicraft, unequaled in commercial acumen. They made the best of a difficult terrain and raised enough wealth to keep their kings in luxury, if not in power. Darius I, in the Behistun inscription of 521 B.C., named Armenia among the satrapies of Persia. Later it gave a nominal allegiance to the Seleucids, and then alternately to Parthia and Rome. But its remoteness allowed it a practical independence. Its most famous king, Tigranes the Great, 94-56 B.C., conquered Cappadocia, added a second capital, Tigranocerta, to Artaxata, and joined Mithridates' revolt against Rome. When Pompey accepted his apologies, he gave the victorious general 6,000 talents, or $21,600,000, 10,000 drachmas, or $6,000, to each centurion, and 50 to each soldier in the Roman army. Under Caesar Augustus and Nero, Armenia acknowledged the suzerainty of Rome, and under Trajan it was for a time a Roman province. Nevertheless, its culture was Iranian, and its usual orientation was toward Parthia. The Parthians had for centuries occupied the region south of the Caspian Sea as subjects of the Achaemenid, then of the Seleucid kings. They were of Scythian Turanian stock, that is, they belonged racially with the peoples of southern Russia and Turkestan. About 248 B.C., a Scythian chief, Arsaces, revolted against the Seleucid authority, made Parthia a sovereign state, and established the Arsacid dynasty. The Seleucid kings, weakened by Rome's defeat of Antiochus III in 189 BC, were unable to defend their territory against the reckless, half-barbarous Parthians, and by the end of the 2nd century BC, all Mesopotamia and Persia were absorbed into a new Parthian empire. Three capitals, according to the season, entertained the new royalty. Hecatompolis in Parthia, Ecbatana in Media, and Tesiphon on the lower Tigris. Across from Tesiphon lay the former Seleucid capital Seleucia, which remained for centuries a Greek city in a Parthian realm. The Arsacid rulers kept the administrative structure built up by the Seleucids, but overlaid it with a feudalism derived from the Achaemenid kings. The mass of the population was composed of agricultural serfs and slaves. Industry was backward, but the Parthian ironworkers made a fine steel, and the brewing trade was highly profitable. The wealth of the state came partly from the trade that passed along the great rivers, partly from the caravans that crossed Parthia on the way between farther Asia and the west. From 53 BC, when the Parthians defeated Crassus at Cari, to AD 217, when Macrinus bought peace from Artabanus, Rome fought war after war for the control of these routes and the Red Sea. The Parthians were too rich or too poor to indulge in literature. The aristocrats, as in all ages, preferred the art of life to the life of art, and the serfs were too illiterate, the artisans too busy, the merchants too commercial to produce great art or great books. The people spoke Pallavi and wrote in Aramaic on parchment, which now replaced cuneiform. But not a line of Parthian literature has been preserved. We know that Greek plays were enjoyed in Tesiphon as well as in Seleucia, 
for the head of Crassus played a part there in the Bacchae of Euripides. The paintings and sculptures discovered at Palmyra, Jura Europus, and Ashur were probably the work of Iranian artists. Their crude amalgam of Greek and Oriental styles affected later art from China to Byzantium. A vivid relief of a mounted archer has come down to us to suggest that we might have a higher opinion of Parthian art if more of it remained. At Hatra, near Mosul, an Arabian feudatory of the Parthian king built in possibly 88 BC a limestone palace of seven arched and vaulted halls in a powerful but barbarous style. Good Parthian work has survived in engraved silverware and jewelry. The Parthians excelled in man's favorite art, personal adornment. Both sexes curled their hair, the men nursed frizzed beards and flowing mustaches, and clothed themselves in tunic and baggy trousers, usually covered with a many-colored robe. The women swathed themselves in delicate embroideries and decked their hair with flowers. Free Parthians amused themselves with hunting, ate and drank abundantly, and never went on foot when they could ride. They were brave warriors and honorable foes, treated prisoners decently, admitted foreigners to high office, and gave asylum to refugees. Sometimes, however, they mutilated dead enemies, tortured witnesses, and corrected trifling offenses with the scourge. They practiced polygamy according to their means, veiled and secluded their women, severely punished the infidelity of their wives, but permitted divorce to either sex almost at will. When the Parthian general Serena led an army against Crassus, he took with him two hundred concubines and a thousand camels for his baggage. All in all, the Parthians impress us as less civilized than the Achaemenid Persians and more honorable gentlemen than the Romans. They were tolerant of religious diversities, allowing the Greeks, Jews, and Christians among them to practice their rituals unhindered. They themselves, veering from Zoroastrian orthodoxy, worshipped the sun and the moon and preferred Mithras to Ahura Mazda, much as the Christians preferred Christ to Yahweh. The Magi, neglected by the later Arsacid kings, abetted the overthrow of the dynasty. On the death of Volagases IV in AD 209, his sons, Volagases V and Artabanus IV, fought for the throne. Artabanus won and then defeated the Romans at Nisibis. Three centuries of war between the empires ended in a modified victory for Parthia. On the Mesopotamian plains, the Roman legions were at a disadvantage against the Parthian cavalry. Artabanus, in turn, fell in civil war. His conqueror, Ardashir or Artaxerxes, feudal lord of Persia, made himself king of kings in AD 227 and established the Sassanid dynasty. The Zoroastrian religion was restored and Persia entered upon a greater age. 2. The Hasmoneans In 143 BC, Simon Maccabee, taking advantage of the struggles among the Parthians, Seleucids, Egyptians, and Romans, wrested the independence of Judea from the Seleucid king. A popular assembly named him general and high priest of the Second Jewish Commonwealth from 142 BC to AD 70, and made the latter office hereditary in his Hasmonean family. Judea became again a theocracy under the Hasmonean dynasty of priest kings. It has been a characteristic of Semitic societies that they closely associated the spiritual and temporal powers in the family and in the state. They would have no sovereign but God. Recognizing the weakness of the little kingdom, the Hasmoneans spent two generations widening its borders by diplomacy and force. By 78 BC, they had conquered and absorbed Samaria, Edom, Moab, Galilee, Idumea, Transjordania, Gadara, Pella, Gerasa, Raphia, and Gaza, and had made Palestine as extensive as under Solomon. The descendants of those brave Maccabees who had fought for religious freedom enforced Judaism and circumcision upon their new subjects at the point of the sword. At the same time, the Hasmoneans lost their religious zeal and, over the bitter protests of the Pharisees, yielded more and more to the Hellenizing elements in the population. Queen Salome Alexandra, from 78 to 69 BC, reversed this trend and made peace with the Pharisees, but even before her death her sons Hyrcanus II and Aristobulus II began a war of succession. Both parties submitted their claims to Pompey, who now, in 63 BC, stood with his victorious legions at Damascus. When Pompey decided for Hyrcanus, Aristobulus fortified himself with his army in Jerusalem. Pompey laid siege to the capital and gained its lower sections, but the followers of Aristobulus took refuge in the walled precincts of the temple and held out for three months. Their piety, we are told, helped Pompey to overcome them, for perceiving that they would not fight on the Sabbath, he had his men prepare unhindered on each Sabbath the mounds and battering rams for the next day's assault. 
Meanwhile, the priests offered the usual prayers and sacrifices in the temple. When the ramparts fell, twelve thousand Jews were slaughtered. Few resisted, none surrendered, many leaped to death from the walls. Pompey ordered his men to leave the treasures of the temple untouched, but he exacted an indemnity of ten thousand talents, or three million six hundred thousand dollars, from the nation. The cities that the Hasmoneans had conquered were transferred from the Judean to the Roman power. Hyrcanus II was made high priest and nominal ruler of Judea, but as the ward of Antipater the Idumean who had helped Rome. The independent monarchy was ended, and Judea became part of the Roman province of Syria. In 54 BC, Crassus, on his way to play the part of Pentheus at Tessaphon, robbed the temple of the treasures that Pompey had spared, amounting to some ten thousand talents. When news came that Crassus had been defeated and killed, the Jews took the opportunity to reclaim their freedom. Longinus, successor of Crassus as governor of Syria, suppressed the revolt and sold thirty thousand Jews into slavery, this in 43 BC. In that same year Antipater died. The Parthians swept across the desert into Judea and set up as their puppet king Antigonus, the last of the Hasmoneans. Antony and Octavian countered by naming Herod, son of Antipater, king of Judea, and financing his Jewish army with Roman funds. Herod drove out the Parthians, protected Jerusalem from pillage, sent Antigonus to Antony for execution, slew all Jewish leaders who had supported the puppet, and so auspiciously entered upon one of the most colorful reigns in history, from 37 to 4 B.C. 3. Herod the Great His character was typical of an age that had produced so many men of intellect without morals, ability without scruple, and courage without honor. He was, in his lesser way, the Augustus of Judea. Like Augustus, he overlaid the chaos of freedom with dictatorial order, beautified his capital with Greek architecture and sculpture, enlarged his realm, made it prosper, achieved more by subtlety than by arms, married widely, was broken by the treachery of his offspring, and knew every good fortune but happiness. Josephus describes him as a man of great physical bravery and skill, a perfect marksman with arrow and javelin, a mighty hunter who in one day caught forty wild beasts, and such a warrior as could not be withstood. He must have added some charm of personality to these qualities, for he was always able to outtalk or outbribe the enemies who sought to discredit him with Antony, Cleopatra, or Octavian. From every crisis with the triumvirs he emerged with larger powers and territory than before, until Augustus judged him too great a soul for so small a dominion, restored the cities of Hasmonean Palestine to his kingdom, and wished Herod might rule Syria and Egypt too. The Idumean was a generous as well as a ruthless man, and the benefits he conferred upon his subjects were equaled only by the injuries he did them. He was molded in part by the hatred of those whom he had defeated or whose relatives he had slain, and by the scornful hostility of a people that resented his harsh autocracy and his alien descent. He had become a king by the help and money of Rome, and remained to the end of his life a friend and vassal of the power from which the people night and day plotted to regain their liberty. The modest economy of the country bent and at last broke under the taxes imposed upon it by a luxurious court and a building program out of proportion to the national wealth. Herod sought in various ways to appease his subjects, but failed. He forgave taxes in poor years, persuaded Rome to reduce the tribute it exacted, secured privileges for Jews abroad, relieved famine and other calamities promptly, maintained internal order and external security, and developed the natural resources of the land. Brigandage was ended, trade was stimulated, the markets and ports were noisy with life. At the same time, the king alienated public sentiment by the looseness of his morals, the cruelty of his punishments, and the accidental drowning in the bath of Aristobulus, grandson of Hyrcanus II, and therefore the legitimate heir to the throne. The priests, whose power he had ended and whose leaders he appointed, conspired against him, and the Pharisees abominated his apparent resolution to make Judea a Hellenistic state. Ruling many cities that were more Greek than Jewish in population and culture, and impressed with the refinement and variety of Hellenic civilization, Herod, himself not by origin or conviction a Jew, naturally sought a cultural unity for his realm and an imposing facade for his rule by encouraging Greek ways, dress, ideas, literature, and art. He surrounded himself with Greek scholars, entrusted to them high affairs of state, and made Nicholas of Damascus, a Greek, his official counselor and historian. 
He raised at great expense a theater and an amphitheater in Jerusalem, adorned them with monuments to Augustus and other pagans, and introduced Greek athletic and musical contests and Roman gladiatorial combats. He beautified Jerusalem with other buildings in what seemed to the people a foreign architectural style, and set up in public places Greek statuary whose nudity startled the Jews as much as the nakedness of the wrestlers in the games. He built himself a palace, doubtless on Greek models, filled it with gold and marble and costly furniture, and surrounded it with extensive gardens after the manner of his Roman friends. He shocked the people by telling them that the temple which Zerubbabel had set up five centuries before was too small, and proposing to tear it down and erect a larger one on its site. Despite their protests and their fears, he realized his plan and reared the lordly temple that Titus would destroy. On Mount Moriah, an area was cleared 750 feet square. Along its boundaries, cloisters were built roofed with cedar, curiously graven, and supported by multiple rows of Corinthian columns, each a marble monolith so large that three men could barely join hands around it. In this main court were the booths of the money changers, who for the convenience of pilgrims changed foreign coins into those acceptable to the sanctuary. Here, too, were the stalls where one might buy animals to offer in sacrifice, and the rooms or porticos where teachers and pupils met to study Hebrew and the law, and the noisy beggars inevitable in Oriental scenes. From this outer temple a broad flight of steps led up to an inner walled space which non-Jews were forbidden to enter. Here was the court of the women, where such men as were pure came in with their wives. From this second enclosure the worshipper passed up another flight of steps, and through gates plated with silver and gold, into the court of the priests, where stood in the open air the altar upon which burnt sacrifice was offered to Yahweh. Still other steps led up through bronze doors, seventy-five feet high and twenty-four wide, overhung with a famous golden vine, into the temple proper, open only to priests. It was built entirely of white marble, in setback style, and its façade was plated with gold. The interior was divided crosswise by a great embroidered veil, blue and purple and scarlet. Before the veil were the golden seven-branched candlestick, the altar of incense, and the table bearing the unleavened shoe-bread that the priests laid before Yahweh. Behind the veil was the Holy of Holies, which in the earlier temple had contained a golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant, but in this temple, says Josephus, contained nothing whatever. Here human foot trod only once a year on the Day of Atonement, when the high priest entered alone. The main structures of this historic edifice were finished in eight years. The work of adornment, however, continued for eighty years, and was just completed when Titus's legions came. The people were proud of the great shrine, which was ranked among the marvels of the Augustan world. For its splendor, they almost forgave the Corinthian columns of the porticos and the golden eagle that, defying the Jewish prohibition of graven images, symbolized at the very entrance to the temple the power of Judea's enemy and master, Rome. Meanwhile, Jews who traveled brought back news of the completely Greek buildings with which Herod was remaking the other cities of Palestine, and told how he was spending national funds, and, rumor said, the gold that had been hidden in David's tomb, in constructing a great harbor at Caesarea, and lavishing gifts upon such foreign cities as Damascus, Byblus, Berytus, Tyre, Sidon, Antioch, Rhodes, Pergamum, Sparta, and Athens. Herod, it became clear, wished to be the idol of the Hellenic world, not merely the king of the Jews. But the Jews lived by their religion, by their faith that Yahweh would someday rescue them from bondage and oppression. The triumph of the Hellenic over the Hebraic spirit in the person of their ruler foreboded to them a disaster as great as the persecutions of Antiochus. Plots were formed against Herod's life. He discovered them, arrested the conspirators, tortured and killed them, and in some cases put their entire families to death. He set spies among the people, disguised himself to eavesdrop on his subjects, and punished every hostile word. He foiled all his enemies except his wives and his children. Of wives he had ten, once nine at a time. Of children, fourteen. His second wife, Mariamne, was the granddaughter of Hyrcanus II and the sister of Aristobulus, both of whom Herod had slain. She was, says Josephus, a chaste woman, but somewhat rough by nature, and treated her husband imperiously because she saw he was so fond of her as to be her slave. She would also expose his mother and sister openly, on account of the meanness of their birth, and would speak unkindly of them, insomuch that there was an unpardoning hatred among the women of the royal household. Herod's sister persuaded him that Mariamne was plotting to poison him. He accused his wife before the members of his court. They condemned her, and she was executed. Doubtful of her guilt, Herod was for a time mad with remorse. 
He called out her name repeatedly, sent his servants to summon her, gave up public affairs, went into the desert, afflicted himself bitterly, and was brought to his palace in a state of fever and insanity. Mariamne's mother joined with others in an attempt to depose him. He suddenly recovered his powers of mind and throne and put the plotters to death. Soon thereafter, Antipater, his son by his first wife, laid proofs before him of an attempted conspiracy by Alexander and Aristobulus, his sons by Mariamne. He submitted the matter to a council of 150 men who sentenced the youths to die, this in 6 BC. Two years later, Nicholas of Damascus convicted Antipater himself of scheming to replace his father. Herod had the youth brought before him and began to weep, lamenting the misfortunes he had suffered from his children. In a moment of mercy, he ordered Antipater jailed. Meanwhile, the old king was breaking down with disease and grief. He suffered from dropsy, ulcer, fever, convulsions, and loathsome breath. After frustrating so many attempts against his life, he tried to kill himself, but was prevented. Hearing that Antipater had sought to bribe the guard to free him, Herod had him slain. Five days afterward, he too died, this in 4 BC, in the sixty-ninth year of his age, hated by all his people. It was said of him by his enemies that he stole to the throne like a fox, ruled like a tiger, and died like a dog. 4. The Law and Its Prophets Herod's will divided his kingdom among three remaining sons. To Philip went the eastern region known as Batania, containing the cities of Bethsaida, Capitolius, Gerasa, Philadelphia, and Bostra. To Herod Antipas went Perea, the land beyond the Jordan, and in the north Galilee, where lay Esdrila, Tiberias, and Nazareth. To Archelaus fell Samaritus, Idumea, and Judea. In this last were many famous cities or towns, Bethlehem, Hebron, Beersheba, Gaza, Gadara, Emmaus, Jamnia, Joppa, Caesarea, Jericho, and Jerusalem. Some Palestinian cities were predominantly Greek, some Syrian. The Gadarene swine attest the non-Jews of Gadara. The Gentiles were in the majority in all the coast towns except Joppa and Jamnia, and in the Decapolis or ten cities of the Jordan. In the interior, the villages were almost entirely Jewish. In this racial division, not unpleasing to Rome, lay the tragedy of Palestine. We must go back to the Puritans of England to understand the repulsion aroused in pious Jews by the polytheism and immorality of pagan society. Religion was to the Jews the source of their law, their state, and their hope. To let it melt away in the swelling river of Hellenism would, they thought, be national suicide. Hence that mutual hatred of Jew and Gentile which kept the little nation in a kind of undulating fever of racial strife, political turbulence, and periodic war. Moreover, the Jews of Judea scorned the people of Galilee as ignorant backsliders, and the Galileans scorned the Judeans as slaves caught in the cobwebs of the law. Again, a perpetual feud burned between Judeans and Samaritans, for the latter claimed that their hill of Gerizim, and not Zion, had been chosen by Yahweh as his home, and they rejected all the scriptures except the Pentateuch. All these factions agreed in hating the Roman power, which made them pay a heavy price for the unwelcome privilege of peace. There were now in Palestine some 2,500,000 souls, of whom perhaps 100,000 lived in Jerusalem. Most of them spoke Aramaic. Priests and scholars understood Hebrew, officials and foreigners and most authors used Greek. The majority of the people were peasants, tilling and irrigating the soil, tending the orchard, the vine, and the flock. In the time of Christ, Palestine grew enough wheat to export a modest surplus. Its dates, figs, grapes, and olives, wine and oil were prized and bought throughout the Mediterranean. The old command was still obeyed to let the land lie fallow in each sabbatical year. Handicrafts were largely hereditary and were usually organized in guilds. Jewish opinion honored the worker, and most scholars plied their hands as well as their tongues. Slaves were fewer than in any other Mediterranean country. Petty trade flourished, but there were as yet few Jewish merchants of large means and range. We are not a commercial people, said Josephus. We live in a country, eastern Judea, without a seaboard and have no inclination to foreign trade. Financial operations were of minor scope until Hillel, perhaps at Herod's suggestion, abrogated the law of Deuteronomy, chapter 15, verses 1 through 11, requiring the cancellation of debts every seventh year. The temple itself was the national bank. Within the temple was the Hall Gazeth, meeting place of the Sanhedrin or Great Council of the Elders of Israel. Probably the institution arose in the period of Seleucid rule, circa 200 B.C., to replace the earlier council mentioned in Numbers, 
chapter 11, verse 16, as advising Moses. Originally selected by the high priest from the sacerdotal aristocracy, it had come in Roman times to co-opt into its membership a rising number of Pharisees and a few professional scribes. These seventy-one men, under the presidency of the high priest, claimed supreme power over all Jews everywhere, and Orthodox Jews everywhere acknowledged it. But the Hasmoneans, Herod, and Rome recognized their authority only in violations of Jewish law by a Judean Jew. They could pass sentence of death upon Jews in Judea for religious offenses, but could not execute it without confirmation by the civil power. In this assembly, as in most, two factions fought for predominance— a conservative group led by the higher priests and the Sadducees, and a liberal group led by Pharisees and scribes. Most of the upper clergy and upper classes belonged to the Sadducees, or Zadokim, so named after their founder Zadok. They were nationalistic in politics and orthodox in religion. They stood for the enforcement of the Torah, or written law, but rejected the additional ordinances of the oral tradition and the liberalizing interpretations of the Pharisees. They doubted immortality and were content to possess the good things of the earth. The Pharisees, or Perushim, separatists, were so named by the Sadducees as meaning that they separated themselves, like good Brahmins, from those who contracted religious impurity by neglecting the requirements of ritual cleanliness. They were a continuation of the Hasidim, or devotees of the Maccabean age, who had upheld the strictest application of the law. Josephus, himself a Pharisee, defined them as a body of Jews who professed to be more religious than the rest, and to explain the laws more precisely. For this purpose they added to the written law of the Pentateuch the oral tradition of interpretations and decisions made by recognized teachers of the law. These interpretations were necessary, in the judgment of the Pharisees, to clarify the obscurities of the Mosaic Code, to specify its application in particular cases, and to modify its letter occasionally in adaptation to the changed needs and conditions of life. They were at once rigorous and lenient, softening the law here and there as in Hillel's decree on interest, but demanding the full observation of the oral tradition as well as of the Torah. Only through this full obedience, they felt, could the Jews escape assimilation and extinction. Reconciled to Roman domination, the Pharisees sought consolation in the hope of a physical and spiritual immortality. They lived simply, condemned luxury, fasted frequently, washed sedulously, and were now and then irritatingly conscious of their virtue. But they represented the moral strength of Judaism, won the middle classes to their support, and gave their followers a faith and rule that saved them from disintegration when catastrophe came. After the temple was destroyed in A.D. 70, the priesthood lost influence, the Sadducees disappeared, the synagogue replaced the temple, and the Pharisees, through the rabbis, became the teachers and shepherds of a scattered but undefeated people. The most extreme of the Jewish sects was that of the Essenes. They derived their piety from the Hasidim, their name probably from the Chaldaic Ashai, or Bather, their doctrine and practice from the stream of ascetic theory and regimen circulating through the world of the last century before Christ. Possibly they were influenced by Brahmanic, Buddhist, Parsi, Pythagorean, and Cynic ideas that came to the crossroads of trade at Jerusalem. Numbering some 4,000 in Palestine, they organized themselves into a distinct order, observed both the written and the oral law with passionate exactitude, and lived together as almost monastic celibates tilling the soil in the oasis of Engadi, amid the desert west of the Dead Sea. They dwelt in homes owned by their community, had their meals in common and in silence, chose their leaders by a general vote, mingled their goods and earnings in a common treasury, and obeyed the Hasidic motto, Mine and thine belong to thee. Most of them, says Josephus, lived more than a hundred years because of their simple diet and regular life. Each clothed himself in white linen, carried a little hoe to cover his droppings, washed himself like a Brahmin afterward, and considered it a sacrilege to evacuate on the Sabbath. A few of them married and lived in towns, but practiced the Tolstoyan rule of cohabiting with their wives only to beget children. The members of the sect avoided all sensual pleasure and sought through meditation and prayer a mystic union with God. They hoped that by piety, abstinence, and contemplation, they might acquire magic powers and foresee the future. Like most people of their time, they believed in angels and demons, thought of diseases as possession by evil spirits, and tried to exorcise these by magical formulas. From their secret doctrine came some parts of the Kabbalah. They looked for the coming of a Messiah who would establish a communistic egalitarian kingdom of heaven, or Malchuth Shamayim, on earth. Into that kingdom only those would enter who had led a spotless life. They were ardent pacifists and refused to make implements of war. 
But when the legions of Titus attacked Jerusalem and the temple, the Essenes joined other Jews in defending their city and its shrine, and fought till nearly all of their order were dead. As Josephus describes their customs and their sufferings, we enter into the atmosphere of Christianity. Although they were tortured and racked, burnt and torn to pieces, and went through every torment to force them either to blaspheme their legislator or to eat what was forbidden them, yet could they not be made to do either of them, no, nor once to flatter their tormentors or to shed a tear. But they smiled in their very pains and laughed those to scorn who tortured them and gave up their souls in great cheerfulness as expecting to receive them again. These, Sadducees, Pharisees, Essenes, were the chief religious sects of Judea in the generation before Christ. The scribes, or Hakamin, learned, whom Jesus so often bracketed with the Pharisees, were not a sect but a profession. They were scholars learned in the law, who lectured on it in synagogues, taught it in schools, debated it in public and private, and applied it in judgment on specific cases. A few of them were priests, some were Sadducees, most were Pharisees. They were, in the two centuries before Hillel, what the rabbis were after him. They were the jurisprudentes of Judea, whose legal opinions, selected by time and transmitted by word of mouth from teacher to pupil, became part of that oral tradition which the Pharisees honored along with the written law. Under their influence, the Code of Moses proliferated into thousands of detailed precepts designed to meet every circumstance. The earliest definite figure among these lay teachers of the law is that of Hillel, and even he is nearly lost in the web of legend that a fond posterity wove about his name. We are told that he was born in Babylon, possibly in 75 B.C., of a distinguished but impoverished family. He came as a grown man to Jerusalem, where he supported his wife and children by manual labor. Half his daily wage he paid for admission to the school where two famous masters, Shemaiah and Abdullam, expounded the law. Lacking the fee one day and denied entry, he climbed upon a window sill that he might hear the words of the living God. Frozen with cold, the story says, he fell into the snow and was found there half dead the next morning. He became in his turn a revered rabbi or teacher, renowned for his modesty, patience, and gentleness. One account tells how a man wagered he could anger Hillel and lost. He laid down three principles for the guidance of life, love of man, of peace, and of the law and the knowledge of it. When a would-be proselyte asked him to explain the law in as little time as a man could stand on one foot, Hillel answered, What is hateful to thyself, do not do to another. It was a cautiously negative form of that golden rule which had long before been phrased positively in Leviticus. Again Hillel taught, Judge not thy neighbor until thou art in his place. He sought to quiet the quarreling sects by laying down seven rules for interpreting the law. His own interpretations were liberal. Most notably, he facilitated the lending of money and the procurement of divorce. He was a pacifier, not a reformer. Separate not thyself from the congregation, he advised the young rebels of his day. He accepted Herod as an inescapable evil and was appointed by him president of the Sanhedrin, this in 30 B.C., its Pharisee and majority loved him so well that he remained head of the great council until his death in A.D. 10. Out of respect for his memory, the office was made hereditary in his family for four hundred years. The council gave its second place of honor to Hillel's rival, the conservative rabbi Shammai. He taught a much stricter interpretation of the law, rejected divorce, and demanded the literal application of the Torah, regardless of new conditions. This division of Jewish teachers into conservative and liberal groups had existed for a century before Hillel and continued until the destruction of the temple. 5. The Great Expectation The Jewish literature that has come down to us from this period is almost entirely religious. Just as it seemed to the Orthodox Hebrew a profanation to make images of the deity or to adorn his temples with plastic art, so it seemed to him an error to write philosophy or literature for any other ultimate purpose than to praise God and glorify the law. There were, of course, many exceptions, of which the pretty story of Susanna may serve as an instance. It tells of a fair Jewess, falsely accused of unchastity by two unsatisfied elders, and freed through the skillful cross-examination of witnesses by a youth named Daniel. Even this romance found its way into some editions of the book of Daniel. The book of Joshua, son of Sirach, which we know as Ecclesiasticus, may be as late as this period. It is one of many apocrypha, hidden or unauthentic compositions not accepted into the Jewish canon of the Old Testament. Rich in beauty and wisdom, it did not deserve to be excluded from the company of Ecclesiastes and Job. 
In its 24th chapter, we find again, as in the 8th chapter of Proverbs, the doctrine of the Logos, or incarnate word. Wisdom, the first product of God, created from the beginning of the world. Between 130 B.C. and A.D. 40, an Alexandrian Jew, or a number of Hellenistic Jews, published a book of the wisdom of Solomon, which sought, like Philo, to harmonize Judaism and Platonism, and called Hellenizing Jews back to the law in prose as noble as any since Isaiah. A lesser work, the Psalms of Solomon, circa 50 B.C., is rich in anticipation of a Redeemer for Israel. This hope of salvation from Rome and earthly suffering through the coming of a divine Redeemer rings through nearly all the Jewish literature of this age. Many productions took the form of apocalypses or revelations, whose aim was to make the past intelligible and forgivable by presenting it as a prelude to a triumphant future revealed to some seer by God. The book of Daniel, written about 165 B.C. to encourage Israel against Antiochus Epiphanes, was still circulating among Jews who could not believe that Yahweh would let them long remain under pagan domination. The book of Enoch, probably the work of several authors between 170 and 66 B.C., took the form of visions vouchsafed to the patriarch who, in Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, had walked with God. It recounted the fall of Satan and his cohorts, the consequent intrusion of evil and suffering into human life, the redemption of mankind by a Messiah, and the coming of the kingdom of heaven. About 150 B.C., Jewish writers began to publish Sibylline oracles, in which various Sibyls or prophetesses were represented as defending Judaism against paganism and foretelling the final victory of the Jews over their enemies. The idea of the saving God had probably come to Western Asia from Persia and Babylonia. In the Zoroastrian creed, all history and life were represented as a war between the holy forces of light and the diabolical powers of darkness. In the end, a savior would come, Sheosiant or Mithras, to judge all men and establish an everlasting reign of righteousness and peace. To many Jews, the rule of Rome seemed part of the transient victory of evil. They denounced the greed, treachery, brutality, and idolatry of Gentile civilization and the atheistic hedonism of an Epicurean world. According to the Book of Wisdom, the ungodly said, Our life is short and tedious, and in the death of a man there is no remedy. Neither was there any man known to return from the grave. For the breath in our nostrils is as smoke, and a little spark in the moving of our heart, which being extinguished, our body shall be turned into ashes, and our spirit shall vanish as the soft air, and our name shall be forgotten, and our life shall pass away as the trace of a cloud, as a mist dispersed by the beams of the sun." Come on, let us enjoy the good things that are present. Let no flower of the spring pass us by. Let us crown ourselves with rosebuds before they be withered. Let us leave tokens of our joyfulness in every place. These Epicureans reason falsely, says the author. They hitch their wagon to a falling star, since pleasure is a vain and transitory thing. For the hope of the ungodly man is as chaff swept away by the wind, and as thin hoarfrost scattered by the tempest. It passeth as the remembrance of a guest who tarrieth but a day. But the righteous shall live forever, and the care of them is with the Most High. Therefore shall they receive a glorious kingdom and a diadem of beauty from the hand of the Lord. The reign of evil will be brought to an end, according to the apocalyptic books, either by the direct intervention of God himself or the earthly coming of his Son or representative, the Messiah or Anointed One. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now.